before you get everyone else involved, know what you're doing. Anything like you, it's very challenging and it's very hard to do. Because everyone's going to say to the director, well, how do you want this to look? What do you want to do? I, I saw that you, you worked with Madonna and... When Kashir's President Sivad denies the intel, the U.S. decides to send a strong warning to cease production. The Seventh Fleet is called into action. al must be neutralized. Hello, welcome on our podcast, John. I hope you are doing very well, and thank you so much for giving uh, time and you know come on this podcast. How are you? It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay, great. Uh, I hope you are doing well. Thank you, I am, and I hope the same for you. Yeah, I'm also doing fine. Thank you so much. So uh, before we go ahead and start uh, talking about the industry, can you please uh, tell to our audience uh, about you, about your introduction, your previous work, and your please share uh, something about you. Sure. Uh, well, my name's John Callis. I'm a 50-year veteran uh, director, writer, producer, um, with eight award-winning productions, including an Emmy nomination. Uh, I've created some iconic work in the film industry. Um, it, it's something in my blood. I don't know what else to do really with myself. And uh, it, it's been a wonderful experience. But I will say to any wannabe filmmakers, <clears throat> it's not an easy business. Um, you have to have a pretty thick skin and you have to be very... Um, uh, tenacious. You can't give up on yourself. You've got to keep moving forward and find those opportunities to launch you to where you want to be. Yes, right. Okay, thank you so much for your introduction. And can you please uh, tell me your journey? Like, when did you start your journey as a director, filmmaker, or producer? And what was your first show or film you did? Please tell to our audience. Sure. Um, I came to Los Angeles to do my master's degree in directing in 1973. And in 1974, while I was in the middle of doing it, I met a gentleman who turned out to be an art director in the film business. And so one thing led to another and he brought me on a set, um, Cannonball Run, where uh, he told me to stand in a particular place. And if anyone said anything, just say his name and it'll be okay. Well, this old guy comes up and says, what are you doing here? And I said, uh, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm not on the set 15 minutes, I'm getting thrown off. So he takes me in his van and it turns out he was the special effects guy on the show who was very close friends with my buddy. And uh, one thing led to another and he kept me uh, on the show with him. Uh, and that's pretty much how the career started. Uh, I started getting a few minor jobs here and there, parking cars for one, because I had no experience in filmmaking yet. And, um, you know, it sort of dropped out for a while and I took other jobs just to feed myself and pay bills. But um, then one day I got another job and from that day forward, I never looked back. It was, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, use the last job to meet other people, uh, network and, um, you know, get interviews and start working with other, uh, other companies. Okay. And which was your first movie you have directed? as a director? Oof. <laughs> the first one I would say is a, a, a short film called Myron's Millions. Okay. And, uh, and I'm going to tell all you young filmmakers the truth, just so you, there's no illusions. Yes, I'm an Emmy nominated director. That film is unwatchable. I, I can't even watch it and I directed it. It's, it's that bad. So don't be afraid of making mistakes because that's how you're going to learn. 
yeah it's happened actually in, in starting uh, you know uh, yeah. when you will keep uh, creating okay you will keep uh, creating good things in a starting if i saw my work in a few years before okay i also made mistakes so uh, if we learn from mistake then we are human so it's called <laughs> Uh, progressing. Well, you can't you can't expect to go on a set like this and and know everything that is required to make the film right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had uh, I had my focus on the actors and I, and you know how many shots I needed where, but I really wasn't savvy enough to understand the fine lines of cuts and how things were going to fit together and um, how to perf pull performances better out of actors. Now I have a master's in directing, so I knew how to work with actors and having been an actor it helped. So the acting bit was not difficult for me. The rest of it wasn't difficult. It was just, I was inexperienced. So I can't look back and blame myself. I'm actually very grateful I had that opportunity. Uh, and I got to look at the film and I thought, one, what did I learn from it? Two, what did I learn? I don't know. And once I understood what I didn't know, that's when I started looking around and asking questions and researching and studying and finding out the answers to the things I didn't know. If I knew something, I didn't know, have to worry about it. But if I didn't understand something, that's what I went after and looked for. Right. So for which movie you, you nominated for uh, uh, the award you're talking about? The Emmy? Yeah, Emmy Award. Uh, Emmy's television, so it wasn't a feature. It was a series called Bobby's World with Howie Mandel. Okay. And I, um, I was called in by this company because they understood that I had some uh, experience in, in visual effects and how to put things together. And my reputation by then had come to the point where people would say, if you can't figure it out, call Callus. It's not gonna be cheap, but he'll get it done. So they called me, uh, told me what they had done with the first episode. And they said, could I fix it? And I said, of course, did it. And they asked me to do a couple more and then a couple more. And by the time we were finished with it, I had done 80 episodes. <laughs> so <Okay. All> right. <laughs> pretty exciting. Great. Howie Mandel was the star of the show. So which is your favorite movie or the series you made till now in your career? The same one or any other? Um, to be honest, they're all very near and dear to my heart because each one brought a certain excitement to me, uh, more experience, of course, but um, it, it was fun doing all of them. I, I think probably the most challenging and the one that I had to do the most research and figure out was the TriStar logo. Because back then there were, wasn't really a lot of CGI. The digital world wasn't happening that much yet. It was all at the beginning stages. And the studio had instructed me that every single element in the, in the trailer or the logo had to be real, couldn't be fake. And of course I, I laughed, I said, so you mean I got to go find a flying horse? Cause you know, a horse, you know, with the wings, that's, that's going to be fake. Right. And the guy laughed. He said, all right, besides the flying horse. And um, it, it took a really long time because I had to run a horse in a straight line for about say 50 yards. And then um, the camera has to come down as the horse is running and the horse has to stop at a specific mark. So I had to do research with a guy in New Hampshire on how to get a horse to run on cement. Okay. And then I said to him, how do you get a horse to stop in a specific place? And I explained what we were doing. He said, put black velvet about three feet in front of the camera and about five feet wide. Okay. I said, why black velvet? He said, horses don't have a perception. And when they see that, they're going to look at it and think that it's the Grand Canyon and stop dead. Okay. I said, so how do you get them to run towards the camera? He says, take their girlfriend with you to the set, put her next to the camera, walk him away, make sure he doesn't see her. As soon as you turn the horse around, let him go, he'll see his mate and start running towards her. And every time he ran right towards her and stopped before he hit that velvet. So it, it was uh, it was a lot of research to come up with that kind of stuff. Yeah, as you know, being a director is not easy. Actually, 
uh, there is lots of thing research and everything you know people think that a uh, you know two three hours movie just like a uh, you know easy work but behind that there is lots of work and research have done for every movie uh, for a, a director you know that and everyone yeah, should right. know about uh, what exactly the behind the scene even in pre production there is lots of thing uh, as in you know the director have to do like if somebody i think make any history movie they have to read all the history uh, about that uh, particular movie right absolutely yeah uh, you have to be authentic if you're going to do a period piece especially right um, I, I think there's a misconception about what directors do. Uh, a lot of people feel they just direct the actors, you know, but in fact, the director's responsible for everything that's in front of the lens. doesn't mean that person has to do it all, but in, to your point about pre-production, you have to discuss with the wardrobe department, what the actor's going to wear. You got to make sure they're comfortable in it. You have to talk about the type of makeup. Uh, you have to deal with a, a, a production designer to have the look of the film. Because everyone's going to say to the director, well, how do you want this to look? What do you want to do? And you can't go, oh, you have to have a, a vision in order to um, uh, speak about it so that they can extrapolate the information and do their job. Otherwise, if you do poor pre-production, you're going to have poor production and you'll have a lot of problems. Right. So you have to be a researcher also to be a director, you can say. Correct. You have to read it and collect the information. You can't even give uh, misinformation to somebody. As well. That's correct. Yeah. Right. So, what was your challenging, yes. uh, challenging uh, part of any movie or series you have done till now? Anything like you? The challenge. It's very challenging and it's very hard to do. Um, the most challenging, besides the TriStar logo was everyone's seen um, uh, footage of concerts. Okay. Now, when I was called in to do the Styx tour concert, um, there was no videotape at that point and stuff. So they wanted to shoot this in 16 millimeter during a live concert. And in film, in order to get the sound and the picture to match up, you have what's called a slate and it goes up and it goes, and at that sound, that one frame sound, the editor takes that audio piece and matches it with the, the, um, the slate, which is the visual. And so it stays in sync. So you can't during a live concert, have somebody run across the stage and go like that every time you run out of film. Yes. And, uh, I was dealing with eight film cameras at the time. And, uh, we had a set up system of people running back and forth with uh, an exposed magazine, loading up a fresh one a lot. But how do you sync up a million feet of film was the challenge. And what I wound up figuring out, I went to my friend who owned the New York Record Plants um, mobile unit. And then I went to Warner Brothers, a, um, a monitor that came off of the audio truck. Now, when I say this term, it's a common term called simpty time code. That's it, it's a throwaway word nowadays because it's used so often. What that meant was I talked to the engineer and I said, if a guitar player during a live concert makes a mistake, can you fix that? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, how do you do that? He goes, well, you see these numbers running across the, the tape board? I said, yeah. He goes, I can get it frame accurate where he makes the mistake. We re-record -re it and plug it into that and just make the mix. I went, can you run that time code or the, the, the numbers to a monitor? He goes, yeah, if you have a distribution amp, we could do anything with that. So every station, all eight stations had this monitor with the time code running, the numbers. So they would start the camera on the monitor and pan up to the stage, which meant you had a mark from the audio truck to the visual and it'll always match up. That was very complicated to figure out, believe me. Okay. That's amazing. And uh... <laughs> I always thought I always have one question in my uh, mind and I, uh, you know, I'm asking you today. Okay. I know it's a silly question, but you know, uh, people have the same question in mind. Okay. Like sure. a director uh, is the main 
part of a movie okay then actors and then other crew member okay so like who decide the salary of a director the producer or a director uh, you know uh, give the estimate or take um, uh, like a percentage of the uh, profit how how it's work like in the business uh, i want to know about yeah. Okay, so the financial end of the business is an interesting question. Um, you asked uh, who pays the director, how they get paid, and right. all that. All right, well, there's a couple of things. Um, if a director comes with partial financing, okay. that's a whole different negotiation. Um, producers often look around and say, uh, who do we know that directs? Who do we like their work? Or, you know, they ask friends and get recommended. And then you go in and you have a conversation, you show them some work, you talk about what their script is and what you think the vision could look like. Um, and then depends greatly on the size of the budget, what your salary is going to be, whether or not you're a union. Now, I'm a Directors Guild member, so I can't um, ask for less money than the minimum of what the Guild requires us to be paid. And so if if a producer wants to hire me, they also have to sign an agreement with the Directors Guild um, saying that they will honor all of the basic agreements and um, and adhere to the rules of the Directors Guild. Okay. Um, and so you'll get a minimum, but uh, of course, most of us don't work for the minimum. Uh, and the more experience you get, the bigger, you know, the, the salary. So when you get up into the huge, huge budgets, you can be looking at couple of million dollars, two, three, four million dollars uh, a director gets. Okay. Uh, but that those are the really high end directors. And then they profit participate um, depending on their level of experience and reputation right. um, and box office. If you're a director that's made the studio billions of dollars, they're going to give you whatever you want. Yeah. If you're a director that's cost the studio hundreds of thousands, it's going to be a tough game to play with them. So it, it is a business, first and foremost, and you have to understand when you are pitching a, a, a project to investors or the studio, you have to keep in mind what their needs are. And it's not the creative, it's how are they going to get their money back? Right. Why is your film marketable? Who are you marketing to? Uh, what's your audience? What's your age group? And so on and so forth. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is a business and it's complicated and you have to be prepared to answer those questions. So director will be the responsible for any loss or any profit if there will be in that particular movie. No, the director is not. The producer would be responsible for the, the tracking of the money, the loss, the, you know, and that. Okay, all right. So one more thing, like uh, all the sets, like uh, I saw the big sets in the movie. Okay, who decide that, like, oh, director or is there any other department uh, person decide the set who decide yes if you have a, a good enough size budget okay. uh, that you're building sets then before you even get to that point you would hire what's called a production designer okay and you and that designer would sit down and he or she would ask you questions about what's your vision of what are you doing here what are you feeling like what's what's your color template, you know, and things like that. And so they talk to you about the story. They talk to you about what your emotional content is and all that. And then they go away and start making some drawings of what they think the set could look like and, and some of the production designed elements around it. I mean, do you have big poles in the, in the room? Do you have big windows? Is it curtains? Is it drapes? Is it tile? And all those things get discussed and then they go off and, and uh, hire a, uh, an art director and it and a set design company that gets in and builds the sets and so on and so forth. So you first start out with the production designer um, after you as the director understand the vision you want. Okay. And what about the location? Who decides the location? Like we have to shoot here in uh, in Los Angeles, we shoot in other state or other country. Who decides that? The locations. All right. So in pre-production, you hire what's called a location scout. Oh. And a location scout will sit with the director and the director will say, here's what I need. I need a, um, a mansion with a huge entryway with a large staircase going up 
and uh, it's got to be very um, 16th century. Okay. Okay. So then they know all of the places around and they go scouring all over and they picture, take pictures and different angles and stuff. And they present it to you and you look and you say, okay, I'd like to see that, that, and that. And you go out and you see it with him alone first. As the director, you want to make sure that before you get everyone else involved, know what you're doing. So I'll pick all of the locations that I like, and then I'll do what's called a tech scout with the director of photography, um, the gaffer, uh, and the other keys, you know, uh, the, the assistant director, um, and people who are needed to understand what the logistics of, of each location. For example, if you're shooting an exterior of a mansion, where are you going to put all the crew, the, the equipment? How are you going to get electricity in there? So those become a technical aspect. So that's why you do what's called a tech scout. It's only meant for technical reasons because you've already uh, agreed on the location. And now I've been on shoots where the director of photography said, it's a great location, but it's impossible to shoot. You say, why? He said, the ceilings are too low. You've got this, you're, you're limited with angles. And we've had to scrap that and go find another location. And then he'll come in and look and go, okay, I can work with this. So it becomes collaborative, certainly, because you don't want to give the director of photography handcuffs. You want to give them as much space as you can to let them do their job. So it, it has to be a symbiotic relationship with a lot of people. Okay. Wow. I'm learning lots of amazing things from you today. <laughs> and, we, you know, after me, well, when the episode will be out, okay, all the audience who will watch this, they will be also learning the same thing because... Lots of people don't know about this, okay? And uh, like uh, one more thing, like who decide uh, the actor, who should be the actor, actresses and all crew, who, who decide that? Well, again, it comes down to what level of, um, of uh, reputation you have. Um, generally speaking, the way it would work is the stakeholders, the investors, may or may not have something to say about it. They can say, I don't want that actor. And, you know, generally you want to listen to them. Okay. Um, so you find somebody else, but generally you'll sit down with what's called a casting director. And let's say there are five casting parts you want to deal with. Okay. You have to give them specific um, descriptions and uh, ideas of what these characters stand for. Uh, I want this girl, five foot three, blonde hair, um, uh, light complexion. This man I want around six foot, uh, heavy set, um, darker tone skin, um, speaks with an accent. Okay. This one I want, and you give all the descriptions. Okay. Um, and then you tell the casting director what the part is. This person is emotionally unstable and they're just whacked this craziness. This one's the only stable one in the, in the crew or the, um, the family, let's say. And they try to make sense of everything. So they're the intellectual one. So they start piecing these things together that you give them as the director of what you're looking for. They bring in different casting uh, actors and actresses. Um, in the old days, there wasn't this online stuff where they presented reels. I don't like that. I want to meet with the actors. I want to give them direction to see if they take direction well. I want to see if they're going to be nervous in front of a casting group because if they're nervous there, when you get them on the set, they're going to freeze. So you have to look at that uh, as well. Um, some actors just don't give good auditions and you have to know that. Right. There was one actor on my last film that I thought I didn't like the, the audition at all. And my co-producer said, I've worked with this person and I'm telling you, they'll perform for you. And I said, okay. I mean, they've got the look, they've got the, the height, the weight, everything right there. It's just, I wasn't convinced that they could pull the part off. And they did. Now we had some <clears throat> challenges where I had to cut around a little bit, but that's going to happen anyway, any film you do. Um, so it, it, it is collaborative to some degree, but as the director, I would prefer having the final say on casting because I've got to work with them and I've got to know that what I'm directing and the direction I'm taking it is going to work with the actors I have. Okay. And uh, I hear uh, like, when we are talking about the casting okay i hear about like uh, in the previous episode okay i talked with uh, some actresses okay 
and she was talking about uh, like casting couch by the casting directors so it's happened in uh, us also unfortunately um sexual harassment and sexual favors uh is prevalent in our business uh what i encourage actresses to understand is they are making the decision to do that nobody's breaking their arm and they need to stop i mean it's their morals it's their ethics you can't do something that's not right and then later on say oh i did it because um you know he forced me yeah. no yeah. no you you're doing that of your own volition um i completely disagree with the casting couch Uh, I've never done it. I've been approached by actresses saying, "What do I have to do to get this part?" And I said, "Do a good audition." Uh -huh. They said, "No, no. I mean, you want to go to dinner? You want to do?" I no, I don't play like that. Yeah. So it, you know, it depends on the people you're with. I mean, obviously, a lot of people are sitting in jail right now because they chose to be unethical and use women as uh, a means for sexual favors to get parts. I wish that could stop because it's just not right. All right, got you. Understand. and uh, one more thing i always think about when uh, like when uh, a movie came out okay it take uh, years and months okay to make a movie like why it take so much time if we go and we can shoot in a month why why it take years for a big budget movies what exactly happened I think the difference is the budget. <clears throat> um when you don't have a big budget, you're having to shoot more pages than is manageable in a day. Okay. Um and the more pages you have to shoot, the less coverage you're going to get. So the difference between the high quality looking movies and the lower budget movies is that the lower budget movies don't have the time or budget to get the little shots like a hand picks up the gla the glass and you follow it up to them and then you see somebody looking at the glass and things like that so what you wind up doing is you and I be talking and the glass just comes in period you don't have time for the inserts and stuff um following feet you know down the street you don't have time for that so you do a wide shot you see somebody walking down the street um so it it has a, a very direct correlation to the size of your budget will give you the time necessary to work with the actors. Now, I try to limit uh no more than 3 pages a day so that I can literally sit and work with the actors because I don't want to just get in there and say, "All right, here's your blocking. Let's go. Let's shoot, 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 shoot." Because you're not going to get a good performance out of them. So you have to uh you have to understand each actor and what their needs are and uh and hopefully it it all comes together that way. Okay. All right. Uh, one more thing like uh, when you go and start shooting there is a slate uh, where the production name and the movie name and then top why why you use that slate why use that okay remember we talked about the music video right yeah all right so if you and i are talking right now and we were doing a movie okay right i would say to you okay we've got the film rolling we got the audio rolling and now i'm going to slate it right yeah. and i go marker now the editor finds that one frame that he he sees the slate clicking okay he lines that up with the picture of that and then they melt together and then the audio stays in sync otherwise you can never lip sync the audio because you have no frame of reference there's no reference point okay so the slate is your reference point that marries the picture and the audio together while you're shooting okay the lip sync and all right so because it will uh, yeah in music it will make a uh, long uh, uh you know it's called you know when you go in music uh, form there are like uh, this uh, so it will make yeah. bigger, correct wave i think wave music wave will be bigger yeah yes in a sense but you you don't use a slate certainly in music um it's this is specifically for a uh, visual and audio marriage uh because if you just start rolling film and rolling tape yeah. how do you find the spot where the lips are matched it could take it endless hours and you finally say oh there it is i i see his lips making sense with the what he's saying instead of oh hello hello you know the audio's off uh um, yeah. so it just speeds up the process okay 
so uh, in a movie audio and the video uh, are uh, you know recorded separately right audio is uh, you always record it separately separately and then mix up yeah. uh, right mix up and matching the audio and the video and the sound effects and the, so if yeah. In your time, like when you uh, started your career as a director, so uh, the CGI, visual effects, VFX, there was all these at that time or not at that time? No? No. At the time I started, it was only film, 35 millimeter film. Well, it's 16 also, but 35 millimeter film. <clears throat> and on 35 millimeter film, you don't there's no way to record sound on it. So you have to record the sound separately and then marry them later. But when I first started, um, like with the TriStar logo, there wasn't, the digital world didn't exist. So we had, I believe over 300 elements that we had to keep matting down together to make it feel like just one piece of film opening up. Okay. And that, uh, in the old, well, I'll give you an, instant, uh, an example. In the digital world, when I go into a, a bay, I can ask him to bring the, the greens down a little bit here, bring the blues up, uh, I, the, you know, yeah, can we take the yellow a little bit off and we can adjust it and we can do a color correction right then and there. Okay. The old days, we would sit in a movie theater, a screening room really, and the director of photography and I'd be looking and he would turn to the colorist and say, you need to bring the blues down two points. I want the greens up one point. The yellows bring a half a point. Then we would go away, they would reprint it with the new color codes, and we'd come back and say, eh, I think we better bring the blues up a little bit more. They'd go back, reprint it again. Very expensive process and very time consuming because you, you don't get an instant look. You had to send it to the lab. They adjusted the, the valves. So, okay, he wants two more points here, one point here, less that. Uh, and then they, they put all the color stuff in and they print out the, the, uh, the print. And you look at it and you say, that's it. And so you lock those numbers in for the, the film. So that was difficult, very difficult, time consuming and expensive. Also. Very time consuming, very technical. And the director of photography is really, I mean, I would look at him and say, you know, uh, it seems a little blue to me. And he'd say, yeah, it is. He'd say, bring down the blue, uh, probably two points. They know these points and they know how much to bring it up and down because that's their job. And that's why you hire them. You rely on their skill set to make the film the way you want it. So, um, oh, good. Can you tell me, like, who was your favorite actor or actresses you hired in your movie in your career? I I saw that you you worked with Madonna and also you know famous artist of that time I saw, right? Yeah, no, I've, I've worked with a lot of very uh, high-end A-list talent, uh, Mel Brooks, Mel Gibson, uh, the list goes on, uh, Jack Nicholson, all that. Um, your question is who hires him? No. I'm sorry. Who was your favorite one? Oh, who was my favorite? I'm sorry. The one you um, And who was easy to understand your goal and uh, you know done the great job in first shot without any tape extra tape it's an interesting question i'm not sure i have a favorite um it's funny because the a-listers that i got to work with mm -hmm. were all absolute gems they were wonderful to work with professional you know, unassuming, they came to do a job. They did it very well. Some of the up and comings um, kind of are full of themselves a little bit. They're, you know, they're getting their confidence and the egos are a little out of control. So they come in with an attitude and you have to start working with those kind of things. It slows things down and it doesn't make it as pleasant as you want it. Then they start tending to try to argue with your directions. Well, no, I don't think the character would do that. And you have to sit there going, oh, dear. Here we go. And, and, you know, you have to be smart about it because you don't want to get them in their heads. You got to keep them in their hearts acting. Right. And you say, well, what do you think the character would do? And you say, well, if I was doing it, I say, no, no, no. That's what I was afraid of. You're thinking about what you would do. What would the character do? And then that would slow them down a little bit. And you just, you have to work them into where you want. Um, sometimes uh, I've had my producer come and say, 
what exactly, where are you going with this? I said, just keep an eye. And what I do is I take them away from where I want them, knowing full well if I do that, they're going to pull it right back to where I want it because there's only so many choices of, of how to play something. And you have to sometimes work with them to get them comfortable to make the choices theirs instead of yours. I'm not in front of the camera. They're the ones that need to be 100% supported and, um, and give them everything they need to be comfortable, to be able to feel that they can play in front of the camera. You know, they can, they can put everything they have into it without fear of anything. And they know that they're in good hands because you as a director are keeping an eye. Uh, Eric Roberts, when I worked with him, said, I have a favor to ask. I said, sure, what's up? He goes, I don't like the camera below my nose. Uh, it's not flattering. So can we make sure that any angle is slightly above? Now that's something an actor is giving you. To me, that's golden information because if he's uncomfortable and he sees it, the performance is gonna be like that. And so we, I kept a very close eye on it. One shot we were about to do, and I said, hold on, hold on, raise the camera. And Eric, Eric looked at me and said, you know, because he saw that I was paying attention yeah. and he came to me later. He said, I really appreciate what you did. You really you really keep an eye on actors, don't you? I said, Eric, if you're not comfortable, it's going to play that way. You know, so, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And we had a great time. He was he was a lot of fun to work with. OK, great. So, uh, like, do you have any best moment uh, or remember in your career? Like you never forget and you always uh, Whenever you think that you get a good smile on your face, whenever you think that uh, that time, do you remember any any moment or any anything in in your past career? I do, and um, I'm going to be honest with you and your audience. It's probably the most embarrassing moment of my life, oh. and I'm going to share it with you because sure. we're all human. We all you know, have these moments in life. Right. And, and I think it's especially fun to talk about these things. Right. When I was working on Raging Bull, uh, the, the uh, executive producer said, John, go to the ring, uh, the, the rehearsal ring where De Niro is and get him to look at this paper and have him sign it. I said, okay. So I run over the ring. Now, just by way of understanding, I'm not starstruck at all. I don't care how big a star you are. You're still a human being. You still eat, dress, right. do all the other things that, that I do. So I'm not starstruck at all. So I run in there and I, I wave the envelope and De Niro waves his glove and says, yeah, in a minute, and I'm just finishing up. And he goes in and he does this thing. And, and I'm sitting there watching, thinking, I'm actually watching De Niro rehearse. How cool could this possibly be? It can't get any better than this, right? So he comes out of the ring, takes his glove off. He sticks his hand in, out and he says, hi, what's your name? And I'm shaking his hand and I go, Robert De Niro. And he smiles and goes, no, 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 that's my name. What's your name? And I just almost poop my pants. That's how nervous I got. I said, here, here's an envelope. And I start running out and he goes, uh, excuse me, John. I said, yes, sir. He goes, don't you want me to read this and sign something? I said, oh yeah. So I'm sitting there going, oh God, get me out of here, please. Now he's sitting there with a little smile on his face, right? And I have to hand it to him. He didn't make me feel like, crap. He didn't make me feel small. He could have said, you know, what are you starstruck? He could have said anything in the world. He was an absolute gentleman. And I think he just appreciated the fact that, you know, what I did was innocent. It wasn't disrespectful, certainly. And uh, I had to go outside and sit on the curb for a couple minutes because I just went, oh, God, oh, <laughs> how am I going to look this down? <laughs> But well, <laughs> it's it's just always makes me smile every time I think of that moment. <laughs> yeah, I all yeah, it's you know these moments, uh, you know something happened in the you know life uh, that we can't forget that moment. So that's good. Okay, and all the audience, all the people who will watch this video, whenever after even fifteen year. 50 year okay they will be also uh, laugh or they will feel smile after uh you know yeah. watching this okay so what, what is your uh like uh, do you have any project running right now or in future coming project actually yes i, I have three okay. um i wrote an adaptation from a new uh new york times best-selling author called lightning strikes twice okay. And the producers had me write the adaptation. They're out um, with the studios right now because it's 
it's a huge budget. It involves the Navy and we got permission from the Department of Justice to use some of the assets and so on and so forth. But getting a movie uh, over $100 million made is not easy. So these two producers, if anyone can do it, they will. But so that's one thing. Um, I wrote a novel called Christmas Voices that I turned into a screenplay. And it's a holiday family film uh, and it's a modern day Scrooge. Uh, I've done a 24 detail page budget um, uh, analysis. I've got a shooting schedule, an investor package, and we have a couple of opportunities that are knocking on the door to get this thing financed. In the meantime, I've also been commissioned to write an adaptation of a novel that hasn't been released yet called Ageless. And so I'm about uh, two thirds of the way done with the screenplay. Uh, first draft. And then there's probably a hundred drafts after that, that I'll have to keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting until I get it right. And then I'll present it to the producers and the novelist for their opinion. Uh, they'll give me notes. I'll go back. I'll, I'll incorporate the notes and then we'll send it out to what's called a script analysis company who read the script, who reads the script. They give you an analysis of what you've got, your characters, how they feel, if it's sellable, is it ready to be presented? or what needs to be fixed. Um, and then once all that's done, you have a, a, a script and that's all you've got. And then you have to start building the package and figuring out how it's gonna look, what actors you want, uh, the budget, the shooting schedule, uh, the presentation package, and then you're starting uh, to look for the money. Okay, okay. understand. And any, uh, like for now, uh, are you making like any kind of own content or like um, any kind of academy because uh, I saw many directors are, you know, teaching online, uh, giving tips or making courses uh, in these days, making workshops, okay, uh, for um, directors. Are you doing something like that? I'm personally not. I have on occasion put out on uh, social media that I'm offering a uh, uh, 30 minutes free uh, to young filmmakers or even experienced ones okay. who need to um, get some answers that they can't find. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people have taken me up on that and they've called and said, can I call you again? Said, yeah, give me a call. You know, we could talk. Um, it never hurts to give back. I'm a big believer in that. So okay. if I can help somebody come yes. along that's new and needs something, why not? Yes. I had to get help at one point. That's so. great. That's great. Well, yeah everyone who will learn because if you know any skill if you have something which you can share to somebody okay don't look money just share because the knowledge is the thing if you will give to anybody the more knowledge you will get okay right so it's good yeah if somebody yeah. ask any help please give them <laughs> and uh, I saw your nature uh, when I first asked you that I want to do podcast. You said yes, okay. So I I like that. Thank you so much again. And I have uh, one more question uh, about uh, this industry. You you were talking about right now that about your first project. You are going to like Navy and all. So if like. A movie uh, need army or navy. Then what is the process? How you use assets? Uh, can you please tell me about all those? Also, like if you want to use assets of government, uh, like any army, navy, or air force, or anything. Please tell me what is the procedure of that. Well, first you have to find the person who's in charge of that division, whether it's Air Force, Navy, uh, Army, Marines, or, or what, because they each have a division for motion picture mm -hmm. um, uh, interaction. Mm -hmm. So then you take a meeting, you explain what the film's about. They ask you a few questions, you know, like, does it meet with their um, moral standards? Does it violate anything? Like the Navy, we had a scene where uh, some guys in a pool showed their butt. Okay. And the Navy said, you know, love the script, but uh, you can't have that because it's against our uh, policy. Said, no problem. Said, you don't have a problem taking that out? Said, no, it, it doesn't affect the story. So I'm happy to take it out. So once that division says, okay, we've approved the script, then they send it off to, in this case, it's Navy. So they send it off to the DOJ and the DOD for their approval, because those are the people that uh, assign the assets that you need. 
The next step after that is once that's done, the Navy then said to us, come back when you have the money, it's all in play um, and, and we'll go from there. So the first step obviously is to get the script approved and then they have to send it up the chain of command and then it comes back. Then they won't do anything after that until you show that you have distribution and you have the money in the bank in order to make the film because they're putting their assets out. They don't wanna have you out at sea and go, geez, we ran out of money, can you take us home? It's just not a good philosophy, you know? So uh, it, it's a complicated, uh, slow process, but well worth it if you wanna use their assets. Okay, so you have to pay to use the assets or just uh, permission you need, permission? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take on that one. Some things you'll have to pay for, uh, other things, uh, let me backtrack. If you can fit into their schedule and shoot whatever you need while they're doing whatever they're doing, okay. chances are you're not gonna pay for a lot. Okay. If, however, you say, I need the ship to head that direction and I need two aircrafts landing here, you're going to pay for everything, you know, because you're taking them off their, their scheduled course. Right. You're asking for two aircrafts that they weren't scheduled to be fueled pilot and go off and come back. So um, that's where the money starts getting really expensive because jets are not cheap to, to fly. Oh. But unfortunately, uh, you're not going to always align with what they're doing because you have a shoot to do. You know, I don't know too many uh, aircraft carriers that want to put a camera by the wheel before they take off. <laughs> so it's those type of things that you have to work hand in hand. Um, they probably ask what shots you're after, what staff you're going to need, who you're going to need, when you're going to need it. And then they organize that on board for you. So you then turn to their liaison on the ship and say, all right, I need the guys in the yellow suits now. Uh, and you, you confirm with them. They're the guys that give the flag warning and says, yes, how about the guys with the red? They go, no, those guys do this. So they keep you on track to make sure you're getting the right personnel for whatever shot you're doing to make sure that it, somebody in the service goes, no, 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 they got the wrong guys on board. You don't want to do that. So um, they're, they're very helpful in making sure you stay focused on that. Okay. So uh, now like the CGI, VFX and all the things came up. So. Uh, now i don't think uh, you know they required lots of like our arm army assets and these because they can create from the cgi from vfx and all right yes the uh, cgi has given us a, a, a huge advantage in doing things that i wouldn't say weren't possible but they were very complicated and not as refined as what cig can offer because, uh, you know, with green screen, where you can put a green screen behind an actor, behind a set, mm -hmm. then later on, you can take the green out and put a whole mountain range in or whatever you want to do. Uh, it's, tr it's truly amazing to watch. Okay. So uh, do you have like uh, any favorite new filmmaker or director in the new uh, age? Like you like to watch uh, his or her movie? Do you have anyone in the, like, in the general? No, I really don't. Um, I try to watch everything I can get my hands on, not just the screeners I'm sent from the Academy. I like to watch films that um, probably are not in the general public's eye. Oh. Like, I went and saw a film that I'm talking years and years ago called Swept Away by Lena Wurtzmiller, okay. a European director, woman. And... The film blew my mind and Madonna redid it. And I went and looked at that and I thought it was not as good as the original, but that usually happens. Um, but she's, she's extremely talented. I don't know what happened to her, but she was extremely talented. So I kind of like that. Um, festival films are always fun to watch, you know, because uh, when you see some of them that are really clever, you think yeah, this director's got something here and I keep an eye on this person coming up. Okay. But nobody jumps out at me now. You hear about uh, Indian film industry also, Bollywood. Have you worked with any uh, anyone here in Bollywood? I have not, but i be honest with you, I would love to work in India. I think it would be a lot of fun. A friend of mine, I'm sorry to say passed away recently, um, went to India. He says, yeah, I got a job in India. I'm going to direct. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. About three weeks later, he calls me from India. He goes, Oh, dear me. I said, what? He goes, 
there's so much fun here, but they let you do whatever you want. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I showed up and I asked him, I said, okay, so what, what exactly are we doing? He goes, I don't know. You, you're the director. You tell us. Yes. And, and so they literally were writing the script as they were going. And he said, it was just a wonderful experience that very talented people, um, great craftsmen. He said, it's just different style of filmmaking because they don't place the emphasis on how much you could get in a day. They place the emphasis on what you can get in a day and meaning what quality, what is it working? Do you need to reshoot something? It, it's from what he told me, it was very supportive and, uh, very much, uh, uh, helping the director get what they want. Right. Yeah. Lots of, you want to hire me? You ready to hire me? <laughs> Yeah, I will. One I day, if, yeah, one day I will get that kind of like big budget. I will definitely hire you. I saw you work, and yeah, sure, I will. <laughs> one day. Don't worry about the big budget. Any any budget, I'll come and hang out with you. How's that? <laughs> okay, then uh, I will. Okay, pray for me that one day I will be a producer, and I will definitely hire you. You're in my prayers. Okay, thank you, and. Uh, do you have interest in politics? Very much so. Very much so. Okay. Yeah, very much so. My wife and I are very involved in politics. Um, we go on marches. We go on protests. Mm -hmm. um, we study the candidates. We study what they stand for, what their policies are. So we're not, I wouldn't say we're too typical. We're pretty involved in understanding what we're voting for and why, um, as opposed to, well, you know, he's a, this party or he's that, or she's this or she's that. So I'm going to vote that way. So well, what about their policies? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they'll, they'll be fine. Okay. So you, you wonder how countries ever survive. Right. Everyone should be uh, responsible for our politician. You know, uh, we should uh, involve in politics. If we will not involve politics, okay, politician will, uh, you know, take care, take it people, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, everyone... my attitude about that is if, if you don't study politics, then if a candidate gets in that you don't like, don't complain about it because you didn't do anything right. to change that. So either in the old saying, it was either put up or shut up. So don't complain if you haven't been part of the solution. Right. So sure. do you have any plan to come in politics in future? Plans of becoming in politics? Yes. Do you have? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> They're not my kind of people. Uh, yeah. It's uh, different. You know, when, when lying becomes the standard, uh, it's not me. <laughs> okay. And um, have any, uh, like, uh, uh, information about, uh, like, geopolitics, like uh, the other countries, the wars and all, everything going on? You get about the wars? Um, we do. We tend to watch uh, different news stations to make sure we're getting a broad scope, including the BBC, mm -hmm. which gives you a very different perspective than what we get in America. Mm -hmm. um, we follow world politics simply because the world has gotten small and everybody affects everybody else. So if you don't know what's going on in other countries, uh, again, you're, you're not doing yourself any service because you can't make intelligent decisions. Like if... I'll make something up. If we were going to travel to Italy and we paid no attention and didn't even realize there was a war going on in Italy, that's not being very clever. Yeah. <laughs> that's putting yourself in harm's way. So we, we keep up on it. We check the websites of travel safety before we go anywhere and make sure we're uh, okay to travel. Um, when the pandemic hit, we were get scheduled to go someplace and they said, here are the countries that we would highly recommend not going to. And one of them was exactly the place we wanted to go. So I had to call all the hotels and all the restaurants and all that and cancel everything. And they said, we completely understand. We're all getting locked down ourselves now. So I think you just have to be a smart traveler if you're going to travel. Have you, have you been in India? No, I haven't. Okay. So you should. I want to though. That's why I'm going to pray for you so you can hire me to direct you <laughs> yes. all over India. To go. I will, I will, uh, I will. <laughs> Call you okay. I'm welcoming you. You can come anytime. Okay, feel free to come. Okay, okay thank you. And I will uh, come with you and show you the whole India. India is beautiful now. It's uh, 
New India. It's growing. I hope you hear uh, you hear about. Where in India are you? I am in New Delhi. Where in it? New Delhi? You are where? Where is that? Uh, it is capital of India, New Delhi. If, oh, New Delhi. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I get it. Okay. La, you you hear about Lal Kila, Qutub Minar, and all? You saw the pictures. You hmm. you hear about Taj Mahal? The which? Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Taj Mahal. You hear? Yes. On my list. Yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> okay. So come. Uh, I will show you. Okay, everything. The best places here. So, do you have? Uh, can you give two tips to the new filmmakers, to actors, or the few? Give two tips. Okay. I'm going to give the first tip that I was given when I first started out. Yeah. Uh, one of the crew members pulled me aside. He said, "Look, I love your energy, but here's what you got to learn." I said, "Okay." He says, "Mouth shut, ears and eyes open." Yeah. I said. Okay. He says, John, it's the only way you're going to learn. Don't make the mistake that a lot of these young kids make coming on the set thinking they know everything. Watch, learn, do whatever you're asked, and you'll start making contacts because people say, this guy is a really hard worker. You should hire him as opposed to he talks too much. I wouldn't hire him. So that's a major tip. The second tip is to find for yourself what career you want. If you want to be an actress, you want to be a grip, you want to be a costume designer, a director, a producer, a writer, pick what you want to do, not because it pays the most, but because it speaks to you and your heart and your passion towards what you want as a career. Then decide, or not decide, but then look at where you are in that process. If you've never been on a set, if you've never been anywhere near a set, your first step then in order to reach your goal is to get on the set. Work your way up, do one step at a time until you start getting into the position where you can be known and people are recommending you and you can walk into place and go, hey, how you doing? And, and get there. It's a long process. It takes a lot of um, focus and energy to stay always on it. You cannot give up on yourself and you cannot give up on the process but it's a stepping stone. You've got to be aware where you are and then go one step at a time. Don't try and go from here to here. Now you can go from here to here. If like you found $5 million to make a movie, well, you just bought yourself a big ticket. Now in that ticket, you can blow it and never get another job, or you can make a success of yourself by listening to other people and getting help. So those are the two tips I think I would really offer your audience. Great. These are great tips. Uh, actually, uh, the second one, let me tell you, uh, day before yesterday, I got a message from a a guy, okay, from LA, okay, he said, uh, I, I want to be an actor, okay, 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 so I said, I'm not uh, like agent, why you are telling me, he said, <laughs> I I saw your video, okay, so you can maybe help me to be an actor. I said, okay, uh, I know people from the industry, so send me your showreel and your IMDb profile. I will share them if they will look for you. He said, I don't have IMDb profile. I don't have showreel because I'm new. I said, okay, then uh, what do you have? I, he said, I don't have nothing, but I want to be an actor. I asked why you want to be actor because uh, this industry have good money. I, an actor uh, can earn uh, big money. So people are coming uh, in not just in acting or in the film industry, in other uh, also because somebody uh, watching uh, that another person and watching his lifestyle and thinking that I can be the same, but he don't know about his. Uh, he is passionate about. He done lots of hard work. He sacrifice with lots of things he don't know about the dark part of his journey he just share the limelights and trying to be like him so it's happening everywhere <laughs> so yeah if people go into acting thinking they they're going into it just to make money they're, they're never going to be an actor no uh, an actor like that if he said to you 
I had, I just, I enjoy playing other parts. I enjoy playing other people. Then the obvious thing to recommend to them is, okay, you don't have IMDb. You don't have a reel. All of that's okay because you're new. Yeah. That's good. Accept that and own it. But now you just define what steps you need to take. You need to get on IMDb. You need to create that. Yeah. So he says to you, but I don't have anything to put there. You say, great. What's your first starting place? He says, I'm asking you. Yeah. And your answer is fine acting classes and go to acting classes until you get to the point where your teacher says you're doing really well and then find another acting class because each teacher is going to give you different skill sets. So start working it and getting to know these other actors who then can say, Hey, there's a, a, a casting going on over here. You know, you, you're right for that part. Go t- check it out. Now you've got a skill set. So maybe you get a little clip that begins your reel. There's nothing wrong with you going out with a couple of friends, make sure you're the focus of it, creating a scene so you can show your acting skills and posting that as part of your clips on IMDb. So people can look at it and say, wow, that's really a good performance. Doesn't mean it came from a film or anything. It was a performance. So you start building slowly, like we talked before, the steps. Step. You know, he identified, yeah, step up. He identified what he wanted to be. Let's take the money thing out for a minute. He identified what he wanted to be. But he also acknowledged, which was really good of him, I don't have anything. So there's your disconnect there. And it's also the connect because now he has to start going to acting classes, doing, um, you know, all the things that actors do, you know, stand in front of the mirror, go, you know, see all of the facial expressions that, that you can use in your arsenal. That's your tool bag. Yeah. So you got to know, like, can you, can you do that? And, and is there anything that's worthy of it? You know, so if you get a part like that, you, you know, you can do it and have people laugh or whatever. So, you know, it's uh, it, it, you've got to learn your facial expression. Those are part of your craft. Yes. Um, so that person, if they didn't concentrate on the money, would go to acting classes and, and learn their craft and their skills. And then they learn all the little tricks. Like, how do you look at it? You can't look at the camera, right? So let's say there's a character here. And there's a character there. How do you go like this without looking at the camera? So you might be talking, you go like that and you say, but Bob, what are you doing? You just, oh, come on, you got to be kidding me. Now, in both of those moves, I went down and up over the top, never looked at the camera. That's a skill that actors have to learn. Sometimes I might even go like this. Jeez, oh, really? Yeah, you're going to talk to me about this guy? you got to be kidding me. Again, no contact with the camera. So those are the things... That's, that's a craft. That's not right. the acting skill. That's a craft. Right. So you have two, two things. You've got the, the creative part of it and you've got the nuts and bolts of the, the craft part of it. They have to melt together. They can't be separate. Right. Okay. You, you give lots of uh, information to us today. Thank you so much for your time sure. today. One more, uh, a positive message to everyone, not just the film industry, people uh, watch without the film industry also give a positive message to everyone. And then we will sign off for today. I have a message for the world. Yes. please. Be kind. It doesn't take much to be kind. If we help each other, we can make this planet better than it is today. There's, I've, I've been, a lot of places in the world, including Russia. And when I was in Russia, right after the, the communist collapse, I was nervous going there. And when I got there, the people were so full of love and joy. I had the greatest time in Russia of all places. I soon started learning by my travels that the people in the world don't have an issue with each other. It's the politicians. And it's the need to control. It's the need to be a bully. It's the need to own so much. I, I, I don't think God or whoever you <clears throat> pray to came down and said, here's how I'm going to draw the planet. And you stay here. You stay. It's a planet, planet. And we're all sharing its resources. There is nobody on this planet that should go hungry ever. There's too much resource. Uh, so, again, I just go back to the, the message. Please. Be kind to each other, you know, stop and think, lend a hand, do something that when nobody's looking, that's kind to somebody, help somebody across the street, pick up a grocery bag, anything that can make somebody else's life that much better, 
will only make you a better human being. Great, great message. And you have thoughts like I have, I realize, because I do uh, these kind of thing. I even have another channel for the, you know, help people about you know, like people are getting victim of scams, online frauds and all. Okay. So on that channel, I give information because uh, whatever information I have or whatever the resources I have, I want help to somebody. Okay. So we do that. And this company also, I when I started this company, I was passionate about the work. So without a single penny, I started this because people, and now you can see I'm talking with you in another country around the world, people from Australia, Canada, America, from everywhere are coming in my show. And uh, people know me uh, from everywhere now. And when I start. But it's people, it's people like you that are spreading kindness and, and you're spreading information to help people, not to hurt people. Yeah, yeah. You're not trying to divide and make each other hate each other. You're trying to bring people together. You're, you're becoming a resource for young people to learn about a business that's very complicated and they get some valuable information from people that have been in the business a long time. So the, the joy and care that you're doing for these people is Thank you. Commendable. That's what I'm doing. Okay, even uh, you know, uh, whatever like these episodes are just for the public interest. I'm not earning anything from this. This is just uh, the, everything giving the time and all, just for the people from the industry. They will learn something from the guests like you. Okay, because you have knowledge, you know, more than me. That's why I invite to different different of. Uh, people, directors, actors, authors, producers, everywhere. So, thank you so much for your time and <laughs> your patience. I really love to talk with you, John. And if you need any help, which I can do for you, okay, feel free to let me know, okay. Well, if you know anyone with $7 million, let's make a film. I've got it ready. <laughs> yeah, pray for me. You are, okay, I, I will I will produce the film, okay? I will hire you and we will make that movie, okay? On, uh, you got it. What, what kind of movie actually I want to make, okay? I want to make a movie where uh, there is no, uh, no animal, it's called, what do you call, uh, enemy? Uh, who died anime in the end enemy in the movie i want okay. a motivational movie like everyone love to each other that type of movie i want like people are are helping to dogs and all you know a, a different world i just have something in my mind i will share you when i will get uh, an investor who can make billion dollar movie Okay, and I will hide. <laughs> I'll look forward to that call. Sorry? <laughs> I will look forward to your call. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I will do that one day, okay? And after a few years, when it will be happen, okay, we will see, watch this video and we will laugh. That, yeah, one day we, we were talking about something like this and it's happening now. We will sitting on the That's how and enjoying the call to together. Yep. To manifest it, you have to speak it out loud. Once it's out in the universe, you can create it. Yeah. Right. If you think positive, if you think you can do, it's not any, nothing is impossible. Right. That's correct. So, John, I heard about you that, uh, and I saw uh, you are a, um, good author also you wrote some books can you please tell about uh, your writing your about your book please well the one that um, helps people the most is a book called when the rain stops um, i've become an experienced mental health expert um, that helps people to understand that um, 
trauma should not define or ruin a person's life. Okay. Uh, we, we all will go through a depressed moment in our life. Um, and it's important to recognize that and have the tools to help. Uh, the book was written out of my need to understand my trauma that I went through in childhood, how I overcame it, what the steps were that helped me to overcome it, the mentors involved. Um, I attempted suicide at 15 years old because I had had it. I, I just, I gave up. Okay. And when I was underwater, and I jumped in a partially frozen lake, something triggered in my head said, there's got to be something better to life than this. And it made me want to live. And uh, it's helped a lot of people. Uh, I, I always use this example. A, a book reviewer read the book and his wife sent me an email um, saying, you know, we read your book over the weekend. And when we finished, he went over to the phone. He called his mother, who he hadn't spoken to in 10 years, and they're now in, back in each other's life. So for me to be honest, I had to say everything truthfully and raw in the book. So some of it's really hard to read. Um, some of it I still look at and shake my head that I can't believe I went through. Uh, but it all started uh, when I was three, when my dad died. And that sent me into depression, uh, abandonment issues. I hated the world. It hated me. I gave up on my faith. I didn't believe in anybody. I started acting out. And that's by the time I was 12, I was sent to a military school because of my behavior uh, by myself. And it was the worst experience because I got abused like hell there. Uh, it was just not a good thing. So at that point, when I finished the book, I decided I need to use this to help other people. And I was working with a team um, called Magnify Your Message, a woman named Cheryl Hunter. And she helped me reshape my whole uh, presentation on mental health so that I could make a difference to other people's lives. And as such, I think I have over 576 million views on the materials I've written since joining her program. Uh, I've been featured on um, Yahoo, Fox, uh, the Good Men Project, uh, a lot of a lot of very famous places. Uh, I've been on television, uh, Good Morning America, uh, so the book works to help people who suffer from those things. And it's a guide to ways to get out of it. Uh, and it, it speaks in two languages, not different languages, but it tells you the little boy's experience. And then there's a section as the adult looking back and seeing the truth of that situation, which wasn't the truth when I was going through it. So we all have those misconceptions. And I think it's a good step for people to have a guide to help them. Okay, great. I will share, uh, please share me the link. I will share in the description so people who want to uh, get this book, please go and in the description, you can find the link of uh, here with this, you know, this book. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your time again and namaste, bye-bye. Thank Namaste. You. Have a good one.